right, Manic Monday. You guys have a midterm starting today, tomorrow, so we'll talk a little bit about that toward the end of class. I have a few minutes to review, but uh, we're also going to keep talking about lists today to give you guys a chance to continue on on the homework problem. So let me do that first, and then any remaining time we have toward the end of class, I'll be happy to take questions about objects to get you guys ready for your midterm, which starts today um, and then runs through Wednesday. Okay, so back to last time. So what we started to work on, what you guys actually finished doing last Friday, was building an implementation of a list. A list is a uh, generalization of an array that allows us to add and remove elements. So it's an array that allows us to change the size of the array as the program is running. Uh, which is really useful in a lot of real world scenarios. We're going to look at, you know, and again, this is sort of the, the you know, the first part is something that arrays do. Um, the second, the ability to change the size of the list by adding elements, um, both at the beginning or the end or really anywhere in the list and removing elements from anywhere in the list is what distinguishes a list from an array. And lists are a tremendously useful data structure for solving a lot of real world problems, okay? All right, so, you guys are gonna implement lists twice. You've done one uh, version, you have one last wrap up question today, uh, doing array list equality, and then we're going to move on to working on implementing lists using a different approach. Um, and you know, one of the reasons we're doing this is not only to demystify how these data structures actually work under the hood, so when you guys get you know, when you guys use languages that make things easier for you, like Python, or when you get on to later courses like uh, 225, you have some sense of what's going on under the hood when you use something like a vector, right, which has some of these features, okay? Um, so, and it also gives us a great opportunity to look at how interfaces work, right? Um, the interface that we're using, um, that we're, you guys are implementing, both with your array list and your link lists, the fact that that interface is consistent means that the user of your list doesn't have to know what kind it is, uh, which is pretty cool. So if you write well-written Java code that uses a list reference type, then later if you decide, oh, okay, my access pattern is a little, uh, isn't working well for this particular implementation of a list, you can swap out the implementation very easily, and the rest of your code can say the same, and it just gets faster, because the two lists behave the same way, even if internally those operations are implemented very differently. Right, so both the array list that you guys have already done and the link list you'll start working on tomorrow behave identically from the perspective of the user of the interface. But behind the scenes, you guys are gonna see that they are implemented very differently. Right, so, um, and then, you know, we'll, we'll have a chance to see this again when we talk about other data structures and other algorithms uh, later in the course, right? And, and, you know, the overall trade-off here is pretty simple. Array lists make it fast a list that stores items in an array usually makes it fast to look up or change items based on their index. So once I already have the list in place, it's fast to ask what item is a particular index, it's also fast to change that index. So these are array operations, and the reason why they're fast is because the underlying storage is an array. So an array helps make those operations fast. Now, though, if I want to actually modify the list, if I want to stick an element in somewhere, you guys have seen, as you implemented add and remove, that there's a lot more work to do. I potentially have to copy the entire array in order to keep the property. So essentially, the property that allows me to make the lookups fast, and this is, again, there's one of these fundamental trade-offs here, right? There's no getting away from this. The property that allows me to make the lookups fast also makes it slow to modify the list, okay? So, you know, because I want to keep things in an array and I want that array to be contiguous, if I insert something in the middle, I've got a bunch of items that need to be moved around, okay? So fast lookups, slow modifications. That's the array list trade-off. Uh, link lists, we're going to see, have generally slow lookups. It actually takes um, a lot longer to find an item in a linked list, but what we get for that is that certain operations on the list, certain modifications are fast, particularly modifications to the ends of the list. So adding things to the beginning, adding things to the end in a linked list, I can make those very fast. Finding an item, eh, that's not that slow. So again, we have a fundamental trade-off here between these two list implementations. They both do the same thing. They can both do all of the same operations, but the performance of those operations is very different. 
And so again, this comes down to kind of what distinguishes you as a computer scientist. As a programmer, you can implement both of these. As a computer scientist, you know when to use each one because you know the differences between how they uh, behave under certain conditions. And so if somebody in an interview says, okay, well, I have a problem where, you know, I'm gonna create a list of items and then I need to look up and modify that list a lot, but I'm not gonna change the list very often. I don't add or remove items from the list very often. Then you're gonna think, okay, well, an array list might be a good, um, good fit for this because the slow parts of the array list or those modifications you're not gonna do very often. But if they say, okay, I've got a list and mainly what I do is I add things to the front and back or add and remove items from the front and back of the list, I usually don't access items in the interior of the list very often, if not at all, then you're gonna think, oh, okay, well, linked list might work better then. Okay, so here's the interface that we're using for both lists. Again, these two lists behave identically. You can use them without knowing which one you're using, okay? Um, and, you know, actually we're gonna have some, uh, some questions on some of the upcoming quizzes that involve guessing which list you are using based on performance characteristics of that, of that implementation. But I can give you a list. I can give you a reference to a list, to a simple list. And you can add and remove items to it, and you don't know whether I've implemented it using an array, using linked, linking items together, or in some other fancy way, right? Um, this is our sort of distillation of the Java list interface, and what we started talking about on Friday was another way to do this. So we talked about array lists, you know, those are, you know, pretty straightforward. I've got an array internally, I store the items in the array. When I'm getting and setting items, it's fast, because I'm just basically taking the index you pass and using it as an index into my internal array. When I need to modify stuff, now I've got these loops where I have to create a new array that's little, e either a little bigger or a little smaller than the existing array and copy everything over, okay? So that's, that's rough. That's the part that I don't like. But we talked about there's another way to do this. So rather than having the array, so both of these data structures bring order to data. The array does this by, you know, arrays inherently bring order to data. So when I use an array list, I'm essentially building one order data structure on top of another. A linked list approaches things a little bit different. It says, okay, well, imagine that all I have, imagine that I create this, this new data structure, a new, new type, that stores one item in my list. And all that item knows is two things. It has a reference to whatever object I stuck into that list. So that's my value, right? And then it has a reference to the next item in the list. The item doesn't know what index it's at. It doesn't know where the start of the list is. It doesn't know how many items are in the list. All it knows is where the next element is in the list, if there is one. Next might be null, in which case I know that I'm the last item. But all the items in the, inter in the interior of the list, they don't know anything about the list. They don't know where it starts. They don't know where it ends. All they know is here's the next item, okay? We'll see how we can use that to figure out where all the items in the list are. You can imagine, if I have, if I know where one item is in the list, and then I can find the next item, then I can repeat this process, I can iterate over this process to find all the items in the list one at a time. We'll do that later, okay? And I can build a list of items up in this way. Again, this is, this is tricky, so let's just go through this line of code very carefully. So here what I'm doing is on the right side, I'm creating a new item that's gonna store the integer zero, and I'm casting zero here to be one of those wrapper types that we talked about. It's got a capital, capital integer. Um, you can do this. Uh, this, this cast works behind the scenes. So this takes a literal int, and it casts it to an object integer, because I need an object reference to put into my item. So I create a new item, and essentially I'm saying, okay, item, you're the value you store is zero, and the next item in the list is null. So you're the last item. And then I save a reference to that. So this is actually now saving my list. This saves the reference to the first item. So now I've got a reference named items, and it refers to the only item I've created, and this list has one element. Now, if I run this line of code, now things get a little bit complicated, and we have to, we have to be careful about how we do this. So I'm creating, when this line of code runs, I'm gonna evaluate the right side first. I'm gonna create a new item, the value that I that I'm stores is eight, but the next item is whatever the item's reference refers to. When this line of code starts running, 
items refers to an item that contains zero. So I create this, you can imagine over here, I'm creating this new item, I set its uh, next reference to be the item that contains zero, and then it returns a reference to the new item that's created, and I save that as item. So now I've got a list with two items in it. Okay, that's kind of cool. And I can repeat this process. And I can repeat this process to add as many items as I want to my list. Okay? So I just want to make it really clear, there's no array here. Right? No array. Instead, the structure, the order, of the items in the list is stored inside every item. Every item has one piece of the structure of the list. It knows where the next item is. So if I start from items and I wanted to find all the items in the list, I use items to find the first item, I use the next property of that item to find the next item, I use the next property of that item to find the next item, and eventually I'm gonna come to an item that has the next null. It's the last item in the list, at which point I know that I've reached the end. Any questions about this before we go on? Yeah. Why is it going backwards? Yeah, so the, okay, so the question is, why does, why am I building the list backwards? So the first item I put in was zero, the second item was eight, the next item was five. Because the place, if you think about it, the place where I'm adding the item is at the beginning. So let's go back, this is a great question, right? So let's think about what happens when this line of code runs. So items refers to the item with value eight. Do we agree on that? Okay. So I'm creating a new item with the value five, and its next reference is gonna refer to this, okay? And then I save a reference to that. So items over here always stores a reference to the last item I created, not the first one, right? Um, and so this allows me to, essentially the place I'm, the, the place where it's easy to add items to a linked list is to, is at the beginning. That's the place where it's the easiest. Great question, though. Other questions about this? It's actually sort of good object review. Yeah. Nope. Yeah, it's essentially another version of the same question. So shouldn't the arrows point upwards, not downwards? No. So, so again, let's walk through this really carefully. This is, this is, this is tricky. These are good questions, okay? When I start running this, so when I start running this line of code, right, items refers to, um, sorry, I'm going through this one. When this line of code starts to run, items refers to the item um, with item eight. So items, when, the, when this line of code starts to run, refers to an item with value eight, correct? Then, oop, wrong way. The new item I create called item five also has a next reference to that item. I wish I had a better diagram. Essentially, at some point as this code is running, I've got two references to the item with value eight. One of them is the next reference from item five, and the other is items. And then I change the vet reference to, of, I change my reference variable items to refer to this new item that I've just created. Yeah, try to wrap your mind around this. Yeah, good. Ah, okay, so here's the question. The question is, what does this mean that th this next value is null? So if next is null, it means I'm the last value in the list. Now, when I start creating the list, the first value is also the last value. So when I put the first value into the list, it's also the last value, okay? Now, as people have pointed out, as I'm adding items here, I'm adding them to the front of the list not to the back, okay? So this, when, when I create the item here, the start of my list changes, right? I change item, but the end of my list is always the same, right? So this value that had items, that had next equals null, that next value never changes. Now, in a couple days, believe it or not, you guys are gonna write the code that allows me to add a value anywhere I want in the list. So, if I wanted to add a value to the end of this list, let's say I wanted to put item five at the end. There's two things I'll have to do. And again, you guys will have to do this, and we'll go through some of this on Wednesday. First of all, I have to be able to find item zero. I have to be able to find the last item in the list. I don't have a way of doing that yet. Right now, the only item that I know about is the first one. 
That's one of the reasons we're adding things at the front. So I need to walk to item zero, and then I need to change its next reference to refer to a new item that I stick in at the end. That's how I would add something at the end of it. For this example, the end of the list is always zero. So zero starts out at the end of the list, and then its next reference is always null. Great question. In fact, I think we're gonna get to that in a couple slides. Yeah, good stuff. References, oh, fun. Okay, let's go on. I know, cause I don't think this is gonna get any less confusing yet if we stare at it more. Okay. So let's, so this is essentially what we basically just implemented is a special case of add. You guys did add and remove for array lists, and when you did add and remove an array list, we implemented it so we could put the items anywhere. We can't do that yet. Link lists are a little trickier. So, so far, the only thing we can do is we can stick it at the front, but that's what we've been doing. So here's an example. Uh, this is essentially the code for add to front. This is a special case of add. It puts the new item at the front of the list. My simple link list has one reference to the start of the list. And here's what I do. When I add an item to the front, I set the start of the list to the new item. Okay, start is equal to new item, and I send the next reference of the new item to point to the original start of the list. What, does this work the first time that it runs? What is the default value of start going to be for this class? No, so is this going to work the first time I, it runs? Yeah, works fine. No, so the first item, remember that when I add an item to the list, the first item is also the last item. The last item has the next reference null. So the first time this runs, start is equal to null, so I create a new item with the value, whatever value you pass, and the next reference null. And then I change start to refer to that new item. So now start's not null anymore. So in the future, as I create new items, um, start's never gonna be null. But the first time it runs, I'm adding the last item. And so the next, its next reference should be null. That's how I know it's the last item in the list. Other questions? All right, um, so let's look at this. So again, this is a special case of um, add. It's not the general case. There's no way to add at the end. There's no way to add in the middle. You guys will get to do those. They're fun, I promise. But for this special case of adding it to the front of the list, what's the performance of this operation? Can anyone analyze this from a complexity perspective? Tell me what the runtime is of this operation. Yeah. Oh, one. Do you see a loop? This is a constant time operation. It takes some amount of time to create the new value, and then I have to modify the reference. But there's no dependence on it. This does, there could be 10 million items in the list, and it doesn't matter. Adding an item at the front is still a constant time operation. So again, there's something to think about with the linked list. Remember, with my array lists, pretty much anywhere I put a new item, I had to do work, right? Unless I got really lucky and it was at the end. Here, I don't have to do much work at all if it's at the front. And it turns out that I can also build a slightly different list that allows me to get constant time for the end too, but we're not gonna, we're not gonna talk about that. Okay, so this is, this is a O1 operation. So in general, when we talk about linked lists, n is gonna be the length of the list, but this operation has no dependence on the length of the list. There's no loop, there's no need to enumerate all the items. All I need to know is where the start is and how to create a new item. Okay, so this seems great so far, right? Except, like I promised, there's always a trade-off. So compared to array lists, this is much better. So there must be something that's worse. And in fact, there is. Okay, so let's, so again, now, now we have, we're, we're not making a lot of progress on getting this interface done. We basically have like a tiny little piece of one of the methods, okay? Um, I know how to add to front. I don't even know how to do the general case of add yet, but let's just pretend we're making a lot of progress here, and let's move on and look at get, okay? So get was like a one-liner when we did array lists. We had to do some bounds checking on the index that you passed, but after that, it was basically just a look up into my private array. 
how do I do get to here? My list, so my list data structure, it only knows one thing about the list. What does it know about the list? Look at the, look at the declaration. There's only one piece of private data that I need to store about my list. What is it? A reference to the start. So I know where the first item is. Do I know where the second item is? Do I know where the tenth item is? No idea. I've gotta find them. Now I can find them by starting with the first item and walking the list. This is known as walking a linked list. I can do that. I can start with the first one and I can take the next reference. I'm gonna use that to find all the other ones, but that's gonna take time, okay? So let's imagine that I've built this list and now I want to get to item two. All right, so again, I built a list using my add to front. Now I have a list that has three items and I want to find a list with index, the item with index two. In this case, it would be the last item. So essentially, I've got to start, my start reference will lead me to the item with value three. Now I'm at, what index am I at in the list? Zero. We start at zero, you guys haven't forgotten that. Now, how do I get to the next item? If I use my start reference to get to the first item, how do I use, how do I get to the next item? Every item has a, it's not on the slide, but every item stores a value and a reference to the next item in the list. So I use that reference to get myself to the item with value two. Now what do I do? What index am I at? One. Okay, I'm not done, I need index two, so now I'm gonna use the next reference on my item with value two to get me to the item with value one. At any point during this process, it's possible that I'll get to an item that has value, that has a next reference of null, in which case, I have to stop. If I get there, it usually means that the index that I'm looking for in the list doesn't exist. So let's say I was trying to look up index 10, I would get to the value with index two, which is where I got on the animation, and then there's nowhere to go. There's no more items in the list. And so at that point I realize, oh, this list doesn't have 10 items, it only has three items. Okay, so, but this is how I do this. So this is walking the list. I use the next reference that's stored in each item to find the next item in the list. Like I said before, this would be sort of like if I took all the people in this room and I created a list by giving each one of you the name of the next person in the list. So all I know, I have a little piece of paper and it all it says is the name of the first person. So I have to go to that person and ask them, okay, who's the next person in the list? And they tell me and then I go to them and I ask who's the next person in the list. This takes time, right? This is a, this is a process. It is not, a, it is not constant time. Now what I'm gonna show you how to do here is um, really useful when you guys get to later classes and this is essentially something that's known as, as um, list iteration, all right? You can use a for loop to walk a linked list and this is another one of those patterns that you're gonna see over and over again. So walking through an array for i is equal to zero, i is less than array dot length, i plus plus, right? Like hopefully by now that's starting to be embedded into your brain. Walking a linked list is not that different. Okay, so let's do it. All right, so I've got some, uh, I've got some starter code here. I have add to front, right? And the, one of the reasons it's here is because we have to make a list, right? We have to start somewhere, okay? So I've got add to front, and then here's what I do up here. I'm, I'm, I'm a little, I, I think I'm a little clever about this. So I have a constructor, just like I did for my simple array list. I have a constructor that creates a list from an array of object references. Now here, one of the things that's a little different is that I walk through the array backwards. Because right now, the only place that I can add an item to my list is at the front. I can't add items anywhere else. I don't know how to do that yet. We'll get there. So the way I create a list from an array is I start at the back of the array and I walk back toward the front and I add items as I go. And so essentially, um, I, invert the order of the array here, and then I put things into the array backwards 
And what I'm left with is a list that contains the same items in the array in the order that they were in the array. All right. So now, so, so again, now what now we have a list. I promise you it's in there. You can't see anything about it yet, but we're gonna figure out how to do it. Um, and actually, you know what? This is, let, let's, let's do this. This will be more fun. Let's actually override, I'm a bad professor. Let's override um, to string. Let's return. Oh, I know why I didn't want to do that. Never mind. Okay. So let's go through this list and figure out all the items in it. Okay, so where, so I'm gonna write a, a for loop here. And the for loop is gonna be kind of similar to the for loop that I would use for an array. So let me write off the array for loop for you. Okay, this is just as a reminder. Here's my canonical array for loop. How do I change this to walk through this list? Okay, so the first thing is, where do I start? What's the, fr how do I know what item I should start with? I need to find the first item in the list. How do I do that? Yeah. Oh, you're getting ahead of me. So where do I start? There's a helpfully named variable here. Yeah, the start. So the, the list maintains, the, fr the, the list knows. The only thing that my linked list knows is where the first item is. So let's use that information. Let's say item current is equal to start. Okay, so I'm creating an item reference variable called current. I'm gonna start by copying the reference from start into current. So I have a reference to the first item in the list. So that's my starting point, okay? How do I know when to stop? Somebody over here. <laughs> yeah, so when current is null, okay, what would happen if I stop, let, let, so let's do this and then we'll go back and look at another alternative in a minute. So when current, as long as current's not null, I have a valid item that I need to look at, okay? How do I know when to stop, uh, how do I get to the next item? So I've got my starting condition, I have my stopping condition, What's my update? How do I get to the next value? So in array, I bump the index. Here, what do I do? This is the trickiest part. Yeah. Yeah. All right, behold. And now let's print current.value. And let's see if this works. Ah, <laughs> look at that. Okay, so again, this is different. This is, this is harder than the stuff you've seen before. It's good object review, there's references in there going on. I've got a reference variable called current. Again, this is another one of those canonical for loops that when you guys start working with C++ and C and lower level languages, you guys are gonna write this loop. I guarantee it. I suspect you will be hard pressed to escape from 241 without writing a loop like this. This is the canonical loop for walking through a linked list. It looks very different than a for list, uh, for loop that we used to go over an array because there's no indices. There are references. I'm following a reference from one reference to another. I start at the beginning. I continue as long as the reference that I have isn't null. And the way I get to the next reference is I say reference is equal to reference.next. Current is equal to current.next. Questions about this before we go on? So a, a common mistake here is to say current.next is not equal to null, and you can do that and it will work, but what just happened here? It didn't crash, but yeah, I missed the last element because I'm stopping one element too early. So essentially this says when I, when I get to an element that doesn't have um, uh, an element after it, I bail out, but that's the last element in the list. I want to look at that element. This will also fail um, in certain cases. So let's do, let's create an empty list. Oh, now it's mad at me, okay. Let's create an empty list. 
There we go, okay. So now I, I can also create a null pointer exception because here the list has zero elements in it. So start is equal to null. So now what I did is I said current is equal to start and then I checked current.next to see if it was null, but current was null, right? And so, um, so I blew up here. If I take this out and do it correctly, this will not fail. It just doesn't do anything because there's no items in the list. Okay, let's put this back here. Any questions about this before we go on? This is, this is, this is the crux to understanding how to work with linked lists. This piece. If you understand this, you can do get, you can do set, you can do add, you can do remove. You essentially, because all of those operations involve getting somewhere in the list. Now, it may be hard to figure out exactly where you need to go and what you need to do when you get there, but this is the template for getting to a particular spot in the list, okay? You know, you can imagine taking this as a starting point and implementing get, right? So here I'm walking until I get to the end of the list. When I implement get, I have to walk till I get to a specific index. So I need to add a little bit of a condition to my for loop or I need to break out a little early sometimes. All right. So let's walk through, so, so now the question is, how do I do the general, uh, purpose version of add? So right now, all I know how to do is add to front. But how do I do add at the end, add in the middle, right? So how can I finish add? Um, how do we insert anywhere in the list? And this is fun. This is, this is, uh, this is cool. So the general algorithm here is we need to find the right spot in the list. And then what we're going to do is we're gonna take the item that precedes the item that we want, the, the spot where we want to insert. We're gonna set its next reference to the new item. And then this new item that we're inserting, we're gonna set its next reference to the item that used to be next, okay? So this is, again, this is another place where I, I, I wanna show you this diagram. So here's what I want. I wanna insert an item with value seven at index one. So right now the list reads 581. When I'm done, I want it to read 5781. This is just like we did for array lists. It works exactly the same way. The item that used to be index one, which was eight, is gonna now be index two. The item that used to be index uh, two, which is value one, is going to be three. I'm gonna stick the item in. Okay, so first, I need to walk to the right item. But here's the problem. If I go to the item with index one, I can't change the preceding elements reference. So I actually need to walk to the point in the list just before where I want to insert. So here I want to insert at value at index one. I need to walk the list to index zero, okay? That's one step. Basically, I just follow my start reference. Now, I have my new item over here hanging out. It's got no references to anything yet, okay? So the first thing I do is I take five's next reference and I change it to refer to seven. That's step one. Now at this point, I actually have two lists for a brief moment. I've got a list that starts at five and I've got this list hanging out over here um, that nobody has a reference to. So you have to be careful about how you do this. You guys will probably mess this up a few different ways before you get it right. The next thing I do is I take item seven and I set its next reference to refer to the value with item eight. Okay? One more time for good luck. You guys will see this again. We'll talk about this on Wednesday. All right? I find the in, I find the item with index zero. I change its next reference to be my new item and I change my new item's next reference to be the item that used to be after item five. And now I'm done. I have exactly what I want. I've got a list. Everybody has a next reference that should. I can walk it from the front, and it contains the items in the order that I had wanted. Okay. I'm gonna skip this. We'll talk about this on Wednesday. Let's give us 15 minutes to do, um, yeah, okay. So we'll talk about doubly linked list on Wednesday. Um, let me talk a little bit about the midterm. Well, actually, let me take some questions about lists, and then we'll just discuss midterm format, timing, and I'll take any questions you guys might have about the midterm exam. Any questions about lists? We will come back and talk. We're not done with lists. We'll be back here on Wednesday. Did I just lose this? Yeah, no, good, okay. All right, I think I've sufficiently confused you for one session. 
talk about the midterm. All right, so very similar in a lot of ways to the first midterm you took in the class, okay? Um, there are 10 four-point multiple choice questions. These are all identical to questions that have been on previous quizzes. There is nothing new here, right? Um, 60 points, three 20 point programming questions, all including partial credit. All right, so there are ways to get partial credit for all. Yes, question. Can you guys? Yeah, the partial credit will kind of explain what's going on. Yeah, we'll test edge cases. There'll be some points for just getting, you know, a basic thing to work and stuff like that. There's a couple cases, though, where there are separate little, like, functions you have to write for a particular class that we test separately. There are no questions on coders. Obligatory round of applause. <laughs> Trust me, five years from now, you guys will be so happy that I forced you to read this book. Um, okay, so, the topic coverage, you know, I wanted to be really explicit about this, that's the range of lectures that are covered. There is nothing from last week that's on the midterm, okay? The quiz from last week, is the last chunk of material that will be on the midterm. But all the algorithm stuff we've been talking about, lists, algorithm runtime, that does not appear on the midterm. It will appear in force next week on the quiz, okay? Um, any questions on midterms, object, content, types of questions that might be on there? Yeah. So the question was, will the programming questions from the quizzes that you've taken be released? Um, the answer is, I've released all the questions that I can at this point. Yeah. Yeah, we have a few people that are taking the last quiz late, and so I can't release those questions. And, and at this point, I won't, because it won't be fair to people that, that take it. I don't want to give people that take it Wednesday an advantage, really. So, so unfortunately, I would like to, but it's just what's going to happen, right? So there will be... Uh, no release of the questions from last week's quiz. Those will get released eventually, but not in time for you guys to look at them on the midterm. Yeah, good question, fair question. Anything else? Yeah. Well, the, I mean, you guys should expect, I mean, what, what do you guys think the programming questions will be about? Polymorphism, probably, yeah. What else? What's that? There'll be an interface question, I think, yeah, what else? Just basic object stuff, like create an object that has this constructor and does this thing, it extends this other object, you know, provides a method, yeah. So there's no, I, I, there are no surprises here, right? Um, has anyone noticed something about the midterms? I just wanted to point this out to you guys, just to maybe help you de-stress a little bit. Has anyone noticed something interesting about the midterm exams in this class? They count for a very tiny portion of grade, that's true, but what, what else about them is kind of funny? Not only is the portion small, but it's actually less than, less than the quizzes. Whoops, you get to drop quizzes, right? By the time you take the, should I, should I be telling you guys this? Maybe, I don't know. By the time you take the quizzes and drop the ones you get to drop, the quizzes are actually worth slightly more than the midterm exam. Not, only, not a huge amount, but like 0 0.2, 0 0.3%, something like that. You just can't drop the quizzes. You can't drop the midterms. Other questions? I think. All right, so let me um, just give you guys a couple reminders before you go into this week. I know midterms are some stress, but look, like at the end of the day, you guys are doing really well. You know, the overall class performance is fantastic. You know, now I've got people coming to me and complaining that things are too easy. Maybe that's true, I don't know, but, um, like, who are those people? <laughs> anyway, you guys are doing fantastic. The class is doing really well, performance has been really good, I'm really proud of everybody for all the hard work you guys have put in. Um, this week is, like, intentionally a little bit lighter, but let me, let me remind you of something else. Simmer down. The point of the midterm exam is to get you to practice. If you practice the homework problems, and you go in the midterm and you have a big brain fart and you forget everything, that's okay. You did the work, it'll pay off, right? These, these assessments are inherently imperfect. It's one hour of your life. 
You might not be in a great space at that point. You might have found out something really upsetting right beforehand. You might be tired. You might have a little bit of a cold. You know, you didn't get your coffee fixed. You had too much coffee. Whatever, right? But the point is, like, it's only one hour. And I can't guarantee that you are always going to be in there at your, in, at your best. That's why we do a lot of assessment. That's why we drop a lot of stuff. That's why the midterms aren't worth very much, right? But my goal here is to get you to practice. Okay, so a couple announcements. Midterm one starts today. Sorry, not tomorrow, starts today. Um, I'm canceling labs this week. to give you guys a little bit of extra time to prepare for the midterm. We will have office hours tomorrow, um, all day during normal lab time, stabbed, staffed by the people that normally do labs. So essentially, if you want help, if you have questions about the midterm, if you have questions about uh, MP3, feel free to come by, see Bowl 0403 tomorrow, but there will be no official lab held, there's no lab activity, there's no lab attendance. Um, so I've got office hours today from one to three. Um, the next chapter of Coders, chapter seven, is assigned for next week's quiz. Not this week, but uh, for the quiz that starts next week. Um, I've got eight minutes left. I'm happy to stick around here. I've got a playground open. If you guys have questions, uh, raise your hand. I'm happy to go over any object stuff. Otherwise, I will see you all on Wednesday. Good luck on the midterm.